Kia ora koto. Welcome everyone to this month's installment of the Quake Core seminar series, where we broadcast multidisciplinary research that encourages collaboration and promotes earthquake resilience. My name is Tim Stahl, and I'm the co lead of Quake Core Theme One Integrated Seismic Geohazards, and I am your chair for today. In just a few moments, our speaker will get underway. I'd like to invite you to, to submit questions via the chat at any time during the talk. I'll try to moderate those questions and use them for discussion at the end. And I'll also invite you to ask questions directly at the end uh, using the raise hand function in Zoom. Um, and I'll call on individuals to unmute themselves and ask their questions then. My hope is that we get a, a blend of written and spoken queries. And my apologies in advance if we don't get to hit every question. We have roughly 40 minutes today for the seminar. And just as a reminder, before we get going, uh, please ensure that your microphone is muted throughout the talk. Our speaker today is Dr. Tom Robinson. Tom is a senior lecturer in disaster risk resilience here at Tafare Wananga o Waitaha, University of Canterbury, where he has been since 2021. Uh, but Tom's footprint in the New Zealand hazard and seismic risk space extends a bit beyond that time period. Tom has worked on major disasters around the world, including the Canterbury earthquake sequence, the 2015 Gorkha earthquake in Nepal, and the 2016 Kaikoura earthquake. And he's been uh, fundamental in developing concepts of multi and cascading hazards for impending large earthquakes in New Zealand and in the Himalaya in Nepal and, and Bhutan. So Tom uses a range of geospatial and statistical techniques, as well as risk analyses and scenario models primarily to understand earthquake triggered landslides and their impacts on people and critical lifelines. And he's been focusing more recently on how hazard and risk evolve during uh, the longer term post earthquake recovery. So uh, Tom's an integral part of the team here at the School of Earth and Environment and within Quake Corps. I'm personally very fond of him as a collaborator and overall human and very much looking forward to his talk, which I am standing in the way of now. So I will turn this over to you, Tom, and look forward to it. Great, thanks, Tim, for that uh, yeah, very humbling uh, introduction. Um, yeah, let me uh, share my screen here and we'll, we will get started. Um, I will explain now, stupidly, I've chosen the screen that has my emails pop up in it as well. So um, hopefully I've managed to remember to turn those off sufficiently that you won't get bombarded with them, with them as we go. But uh, yeah, as as Tim says, I've spent, um, spent the last few years um, researching lots of different earthquakes around the world, particularly in, uh, in the Himalaya, um, where I've been basically working since 2015, thinking about the Nepal earthquake. Um, and then more recently having come back to New Zealand now thinking about the the Kaikoura earthquake and and, and looking at uh, things from that and as, as Tim says it's it's trying to a lot of my work has been trying to think around um, earthquakes as a cascading hazard rather than just um, a few minutes of, of very strong and very very scary shaking and so I'm kind of giving away the answer there of, 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 of what this talk's going to going to look at but I think that's kind of accepted by everybody nowadays and so what I want to do over the next sort of 20, 25 minutes or so is, is just give you a sort of magical mystery tour of, of, of the Nepal earthquake and the work we've done since then. And then also ongoing work that we've been we've got uh, going with the, the Kaikoura earthquake, um, looking at these cascading chronic hazards and trying to um, view earthquakes through a much more, a much longer term lens. So instead of thinking about earthquakes as just this, uh, acute short time span hazard, actually viewing them through the lens of um, this this potentially years to, to decades worth of worth of hazard that, that results. And so, really, what we're, what we've been interested in, and what, what I've been interested in over the last years, is, is what happens when the shaking stops, which is where the title of this this comes from. So, once the ground stops shaking, that's not the earthquake done. And so that's that's what we're going to look at. Um, and just before I get going, I want to I want to flag that this is this is not my own uh, individual or, or yeah just only my work this is this is work that's been done by a huge number of, of collaborators some of the main ones which are down at the bottom people I've worked with at Durham and Newcastle University in the in the UK through a lot of the Nepal work um, and then some ongoing work we have here in, in Kaikoura with um, some master's students particularly Macy um, who I have shamelessly stolen a lot of her slides towards the end so showing off some some of her work 
So this picture in the middle here, this is taken from Kadari. This is up near the border with China in Nepal. And it, it highlights what uh, the damage that the 2015 earthquake there in, in Nepal did. And you can you can see here that you know, these are not particularly robust buildings. These are pretty weak um, buildings that we, we wouldn't we wouldn't build at all here in, in New Zealand, but they're what, what is available in, in Nepal. And, and despite that, they've actually, you know, these these have been heavily, heavily shaken by this magnitude 7.8 event. They've experienced really strong power shaking, and yet they're still standing. What's done the damage here is significant rock fall in this case. So you can see here a road that's been carved through by emergency responders as they've crossed the border from China. But actually, these are sort of four or five story buildings here in, in Nepal that have been completely buried by rockfall um, and substantial fatalities and injuries from this event as well. And so this is really the crux of what we're looking at here is you can have really poorly built buildings in, some, in one sense that actually survive the shaking, but in the wrong place. And then how does this cascade over time? And so that's that's really what we want to, to, to look at and what I'll show you through to today. So let's let's look at these these two events that I'm going to particularly talk to uh, to talk to you about and and let's view this through the lens of what do earthquakes only equal shaking and I've given you given you away the answer but let, let's let's just have a quick uh, think about that so the Nepal earthquake in 2015 um, was a magnitude 7.8 very very large earthquake sort of 140 kilometers worth of uh, blind rupture so all underground um, and it, it caused strong shaking over pretty much the entirety of central Nepal. So something like 10 to 15 million people um, exposed to really, really powerful shaking. And so you can see the shake map um, here in, in, in the top left. Um, you know, sort of hotter colors are showing you where uh, we might expect more damage. You see Kathmandu there. And here's some, some images, uh, some of which I've taken and some of which have been um, uh, unscrupulously stolen from, from Google, but you can see um, the sort of damage we're talking about that shaking um, here has caused. Um, and this is typically how we view earthquakes, right? Building collapse from very strong, powerful shaking. And if we go to Kaikoura, it's a very similar story. So here we have um, uh, uh, the map. It's You can't see the colors so well because the fault ruptures are a little more complicated than they were in uh, in Nepal, but it's a still a similar magnitude, magnitude 7.8, 170 kilometers worth of rupture, strong shaking over most of sort of central New Zealand, certainly the upper, upper North Island there in your hot colors. And again, extensive damage from um, from shaking or from fault rupture. So here we have again some some uh, photos just borrowed from Google where we have fault rupture. I can't remember exactly which fault this is, but you know, destroying State Highway One and Main Northern um, Railway Line, and then another well, wider shot there. Um, looking at that, so. These are two really good examples of this because these are two very large, very damaging earthquakes that cause strong shaking over extremely large regions. You know, in the case of Nepal, tens of millions of people exposed and plenty of shaking and fault related damage. So in, in just in this slide and in, in this sense, this is what we imagine earthquakes to be. This is how we view earthquakes. Several minutes of strong ground shaking, some surface fault rupture in the case of Kaikoura, and then substantial damage to buildings and the built infrastructure as a result um, of that shaking. The key thing about these two earthquakes is that's not the whole story. In fact, that's just simply the start of the story. You know, think about this uh, an earthquake as a novel. This is page one. We've got another 600 odd pages to, to go through. And so this is what we really need to, to, to look at and, and consider for both of these events is that the earthquakes do not equal shaking or more importantly, do not equal just shaking. So here again on the left we have just some some very simple examples of of the sort of landsliding uh, and landscape damage that Nepal triggered so these are all pictures that, that we've taken uh, that I've taken post post event when we were out there immediately after after the event so you can sort of see here rockfall uh, pummeling straight through a building that has survived the shaking again not a particularly well constructed building not something that would stand up to code here but it survived the shaking but it's had sort of Bugs Bunny running through the wall style um, impact from rockfall. You can see extensive landsliding here as we look out north towards um, Tibet and the high Himalaya. And then here we have a you know, quite dramatic image of a building being completely and utterly um, inundated by, by landslides. And then again, some, some very similar images uh, here from, from Kaikoura, you know, particularly damaged to State Highway 1 here just, uh, just north of Kaikoura, here's the, uh, the famous Ohau Point one, and then some landslide damming in and around the, the Leader uh, River there, you can see the lake um, forming in. And so the, the Nepal event is, is, is quite substantial, you know, extensive landsliding, probably we, we think there's about 25,000 landslides over an area of 28,000 square kilometres. 
and it resulted in you know significant damage and loss of life. It, it's hard to tell entirely, but we think probably a third of the 9,000 fatalities this event called resulted from landslides and, and probably probably more um, in, in reality. In Kaikoura, um, we're very fortunate. There weren't uh, many fatalities um, and certainly none from landsliding. Probably time of day played a big role in that. Had this been middle of day, we'd have had a lot more people on the road, which have been um, a substantially big, uh, substantial issue. But it's still extensive landslides. Probably, I think uh, Chris Massey and GNS's latest count is close to 30,000 landslides over sort of 10,000 square kilometers. And while we might not have had the fatalities that we witnessed in Nepal, you know, we've got significant damage to critical infrastructure. It probably cost about $2 billion um, damage to State Highway 1, closed it for, for 13 months. And so if we don't think about landslides, we miss a substantial portion of, of the picture. But even here, this isn't painting the full picture, right? This is just looking at the initial impact from landsliding. And what we really need to remember is that these landslides change and evolve through time. And that changing and evolving is really, really important. So again, if, if we look at this, we need, to, we need to remember that landslide hazard is dynamic. It is not static. Landslides evolve, they change through time. So if an earthquake triggers substantial landsliding, we need to consider that into our hazard. And here's just two examples, again, from Nepal on the left um, and Kaikoura on the right that show why we need to be thinking about this. So this is a part of Nepal known as, as Gumba. Again, it's up near the China border. Uh, you can see in both images, um, the Tibet or high mountains of, of uh, Tibet in, in the background. And what we're looking at here is, this is a picture I took sort of a year and a bit after the earthquake. Um, and what you're really looking at is this tiny little landslide up near up the top here. It doesn't seem like it's causing much of a risk to anyone or much of a hazard, no impacts. But when we go back six months later after the monsoon season, what you see is this has evolved into a, a, a fairly complex and substantial debris flow. A lot of that hazard has moved down um, valley and it's impacted farmland and, and people down, um, downstream that weren't previously affected. And if we look at Kaikoura, well, the, the best example of this is, is a slide known as Jacob's Ladder, just um, on the northern portion of State Highway 1, south of Waipapa Bay. This is what it looked like on the day of the earthquake. This is what the earthquake did. And then when cyclones Gita, Cook, and Debbie came through in 2017 and 2018, that evolved and run out. And here you can see what it looks like after um, Cyclone Gita, substantial debris flow deposits, um, dramatically impacting State Highway 1. Now, remember, we've already spent $2 billion repairing State Highway 1, and this is a portion that wasn't impacted in the earthquake, and now it's been, been impacted. So this has real implications for how we recover, you know, extending the time it takes us to recover, extending the costs of our recovery, but also um, in rehousing. If, you know, if we're, we're talking about moving communities, we need to consider how these landslides are going to evolve and where they're going to go in order to properly um, to, uh, do that in a risk-based manner. So we're not pu putting people uh, into more dangerous uh, situations. So the key question here is, this has been asked for a few years, is how the landslides evolve after an earthquake, but there's not been a huge amount of work um, done on this. So this is some work by Odan Mark from, from 2015, looking at you know, sediment cascades and, and thinking around that. Um, it's a rather complicated picture, so I'll, I'll try to simplify it for, for you. What we're really looking at here is, this is the case of Taiwan, uh, on our x-axis, our horizontal axis, we have time in years. And then on the y-axis, we can think about that as being intensity of landslides. This gray bar in the middle is showing us the sort of pre-earthquake rate of landslides we get in Taiwan. You can see it's sort of kind of, it's uncertain, but it's kind of static, low background rate. 1999, we have a big Chi Chi earthquake, we get a massive jump up uh, in landslide rates. And then over time, that cascades back down or decays back down to we reach this background rate. And then we carry on at that, that background rate. We see that here in Japan, um, in Papua New Guinea, and then another uh, example from another place in Japan. It's a mixed picture. But the key thing here is, is the x-axis, the time that it takes us from that initial rise in landslides to get back to the background rate that we, we know um, and are used to. And Again, as I say, the key thing is that this is in years. We're not talking here about minutes or you know, days or weeks. We're talking about years to decades worth of impact. And so this is what we've been really looking at is trying to understand this process and trying to think about how long it takes to get back to that background rate so that we can, we can know when, we've, uh, when the landscape has fully recovered from, from an earthquake. So let me take you through uh, the Nepal um, case study first here, and then we'll go on and think about um, 
think about the other one. So in Nepal, we have a we have a very defined period of landsliding outside of earthquakes. So Nepal has a very heavy monsoon season that starts in um, late June and lasts through to September. And if we look at when landslides typically occur, we see this big peak in the middle of the year that then tails off. So this is what this graph is showing you. We've got um, timing in the year uh, on the x-axis, and then this is time between um, fatal landslides or a number of landslides. It doesn't really matter. And what it shows you is, is a clear signal that we see every single year, not really a huge amount of landsliding in the front half of the year. Monsoon starts to occur in June um, and it starts to peak, rise up, peaks in July and then monsoon disappears and it tails off. So we have a big period here of, of landsliding between June and, and September. And that's really what, what, we're, uh, what we expect to see every single year without an earthquake. And so part of the question there was thinking around, if we have an earthquake, um, what's that going to do? And then what's the recovery going to look like? So here we can here we can have a th sort of theoretical view of that. So before the earthquake, we're getting this peak in the monsoon and then this tail in the dry season. And that happens year on year on year. If we then put an earthquake through that um, environment, we see a massive, or we would expect to see a massive sudden rise in our landslide hazard and our landslide rates, which then slowly start to tail off. And they probably don't recover back um, in time for the next monsoon, which rises, uh, causes a, a new peak, which then recovers back down, but again, not in time for the next monsoon and goes on until we end up at some stage, you know, this is four, but maybe that's 10 or two, who knows. Um, but at some stage, we end up back at this background rate where we're just seeing landslide, not many landslides in the dry season and most of it peaking up in the, the monsoon. So this was really what we're, we're trying to investigate is do we see this pattern and can we um, can we predict when we might end up back at our pre um, earthquake rate. So in order to do that we've uh, undertaken a massive mapping exercise since 2015 so we've been using high resolution um, satellite imagery 10 meters uh, 10 meter resolution sentinel uh, and landsat imagery. Um, mapping from um, 2014, so two years before the earthquake, right the way through till the, well, the results I'm going to show you today go to 2018, but we're still mapping this today. And we map that immediately before each monsoon and immediately after each monsoon um, and then after the earthquake. And so you can see here um, in the top image, the blue outline is the area that we're mapping, which is the entirety of central Nepal. Um, the image below, everything in black there is a landslide that was triggered uh, by the earthquake. And then we just have an example here of, of what that looks like when you add all of those different mapping epochs together, all 11 of them. So gray is uh, a pre-earthquake, black is the earthquake, and then the colors is, is the different timing um, uh, across that area. And really what we're looking for here is to see how the number and the area and the location of those landslides has, has changed and evolved um, since, since the event. And so you can see here just a, a nice sap, snapshot, the sort of detail um, we've been able to get for this from this mapping. Um, I think we've sent several of our, our mappers blind doing by doing this over such a massive area, as you can you imagine, this is all manually mapped. So it's, it's really, really very intensive uh, uh, work, but it gives us this really, really rich data set. So let's have a look. Let's gonna zoom into one particular area, one really particularly interesting area um, of Nepal. And let's look at how landslides have evolved through time. So this is our pre-earthquake event. So here in blue, we have a river um, and in sort of this darker yellowy color, we have um, roads. And then the gray blobs sitting around here are, are our pre-earthquake landslides. These are the landslides triggered by the previous, previous monsoon in 2014. The key thing here is that these are small, they're rather sparse, and they're focused either in channels or close to roads. Um, so that's our background rate that we're, we're looking to recover back to. And if we then hit um, this area with an earthquake, this is what we get, kind of what you would expect. We get new landslides, new locations, typically up near the ridge lines. These landslides are big, they're fat, they're kind of ugly little things causing huge amounts of damage um, in completely new parts of, of the environment. That we know and understand very well. What happens next is the interesting part that we've not really looked at before. So in the subsequent monsoon, what we see is that most of those co-seismic landslides stay, but they now evolve, they change shape. They start to get longer and thinner. Um, they start to spread out. So if I quickly flick back, if you look at this area, for instance, you'll see land these landslides coalesce and they run out down the slope. But then when we move into a dry period um, between the monsoon, not much changes. 
the following monsoon was actually quite quiet. There wasn't a huge amount of rainfall. And so it starts to look actually like um, our landslides are, are recovering. Um, you know, this, this area here, for instance, hasn't seen any, any impacts. These are starting to recede back up slope, if anything. Uh, and then we enter dry season and we start to see stabilization. So I think maybe we're, maybe we're, co we're recovering this landslide. But then the 2018 monsoon comes through and it's a very powerful big monsoon. And so we get substantial reactivation. All of these um, landslides reactivate, new ones form, they elongate, they flow downstream um, and they cause impacts across areas that weren't impacted before the earthquake and even weren't impacted after the earthquake. So here is a good example here, this area largely unimpacted in the earthquake or since, and then suddenly um, is impacted. And so while that might not look like a substantial change year on year, if we just compare the situation the minute the ground stopped shaking to you know 2018, you can see there's substantially different hazard. We've now expanded this, we've moved it downstream, um, new areas have been completely impacted. And so if we were to make our decisions around re, uh, rebuilding or, or, or rehousing based on this situation here, we could potentially be um, moving people into some quite dangerous areas, particularly if we chose this lower slope here as, as a good place, thinking that there's no landslides, this must be safe. As you can see, just three years later, that is not the case. So that's at a real local level. We can actually zoom out and think about this at, a, at, a, at an event scale level. And so what you're going to see here is on the left is a series of maps that show you the changing intensity of landslides across the entire affected area where hotter yellower colors are more intense landsliding. And then what will appear here on the right is a difference map where red means increase in hazard and a blue means um, recovery. So again, this is our situation pre-earthquake. You can see um, we've got landslides pretty much everywhere, but there's, you know, it's, we're sort of in these sort of lower intensities uh, apart from up here in sort of Northern, um, part of the Northern portion uh, and, and up here where we've got, you know, consistent landsliding going on. So then we hit, this area with an earthquake and you see uh, basically, I mean, if I just quickly flip backwards and forwards, you can see the impact um, of the earthquake. And on the right here, you can see where new landslides formed pretty much everywhere goes up. There's some slight recovery in some places for probably some strange reasons, but pretty much everything is red. We've had a big hit um, on, our, on our central Nepali region. And then as we squeeze through time there, this is the first monsoon. You'll see again, if I flip back and forwards, there's some changes. Focus your eyes particularly on this area right in the center of the screen on the left where landsliding gets substantially worse. And if we look here again, you'll see big increase in landslide hazard in these regions, but some recovery in other regions, particularly through here, we're getting blue colors and, and, and recovery. And so if I you know, continually flick through there, we're seeing you know, recovery again, some more recovery, things are getting better. But then we have a period where uh, potentially high rainfall and things start to get worse um, compared to where they were. Uh, then they get better again. Then there's a little bit of worsening, uh, better again. So it, it's a mixed picture. So really what we want to do is, is look at it in this sense. So this map here on the left shows you uh, the landslide hazard today compared to pre-earthquake. And red means worse and blue means better. And so pretty much, Today, we have not recovered to pre-earthquake -earth pre levels. Everywhere is much worse than it was pre-earthquake, but maybe we just simply haven't had the time. This one is much more interesting. This shows us the situation since the earthquake. Now, we would expect this map to be dominantly red because we've not got back to pre-earthquake levels, but we'd expect this map to be dominantly blue. The situation should be getting better since the earthquake. And while we see lots of areas of blue, lots of recovery, worryingly, we do see lots of areas of red and red areas in this map here mean that the situation has got significantly worse since the earthquake. So the earthquake was bad and now it is worse. That's really interesting to think about why that's happening. And that's really quite important to think about the consequences of, of the long-term consequences of earthquakes. And so if we look at that compared to our theory, here's what we were expecting to happen, and here's what's actually happened. So the solid nine is, is the number of landslides and the dashed line is the area. It doesn't really matter. We're just two different ways of thinking. And we see if we have an earthquake, massive rise in both. Post-earthquake, they start to decline a little bit, but then sort of around 2017, for whatever reason, they kick back off again. And in fact, actually, they seem to be going up better more than they're going down. 
And this coincides with a period, an election period of, of Nepal, which is really quite interesting. And so if we, we zoom back into Nepal to see why that might be, what we notice is that that period of election was a massive period of rebuilding. It's when the reconstruction, post-earthquake reconstruction really kicked off. And in particular, roads were built. So these are just two examples of, of the landscape that didn't have a huge amount of landsliding after the earthquake. But then a massive period of reconstruction has gone through. We've built new roads to get access into areas. And you can see here the number of landslides that we have kicked off as a result of that, of a building inappropriately in a landslide, in a landscape that is already near the edge because of the earthquake that has triggered it off. So you can see here how this really has implications for when and how we rebuild post-earthquake. So that's the Nepal story. And what I want to quickly do now is, is, is show you the active and ongoing research we have here in, in Kaikoura, where we're trying to look at a, a similar thing. And what we've been looking at for, for Nepal here is, is thinking about this at the event scale. So how does this map out of the entire event? What we're trying to think about for um, Kaikoura is how does this recovery vary spatially? So in particular, do we see um, different areas of the landscape recovering quicker, or do we see uh, the landscape recovering um, at the same rate everywhere? So this is a lot of work that Macy's been doing. And as I say, I've, I've, I've um, brutally stolen from here, uh, from her, but I think it's really cool to see the amazing work she, she's been doing on this. So whereas for Nepal, we've been mapping it um, for about five or six of us for, for a while. Macy has mapped this entirely on her own. So um, I probably owe her um, prescription lenses or, or something by the time she's recovered. But you can see here, we've been, we've been mapping um, the coastal region uh, along State Highway 1 north of Kaikoura, south of Kaikoura, and then this Mount Fife region and here. And so you can see the landslides that she's mapped. And if we zoom in just onto a particular area of Mount Fife again, you can see the sort of things that she's mapped, each color here showing you a different uh, different epoch of, of landsliding. And the key thing here is in, in everything I'm going to show you now, we've treated the coastal region and Mount Fife separately. So we're really interested to see what's happening in the coastal region versus what has happening in Mount Fife. Do we see the same patterns um, uh, appearing? So similar sort of density maps here that you can see, this is Mount Fife. This is, I'm just gonna show you the Northern portion of, of State Highway 1 here. And what you're gonna see is reds will show increases in, in landslides and, and blue will show recovery. So this is the situation sort of pre-earthquake. Then we hit um, this environment with the Magnitude 7.8. And as you can see, pretty much increases everywhere. This is the cow slip for anyone who's wondering, this is where the cows surfed down the hill. And then as we go through time, we see, you know, sort of spatially variable patterns of recovery. But the key thing that we're sort of seeing, particularly here in Mount Fife, is not many blues. You know, the lighter lighter reds, but not many blues. Whereas if we look at the coastal region, we see a variable pattern, but we do see blues appearing, which means that we're seeing recovery in the coastal area and not a huge amount of recovery over here um, in Mount Fife. So if I keep clicking through, you see those changes. So if we put that side by side with, with what we've seen over the, the time in Nepal, here we have the coastal area. And again, solid is number, dashed is, is area. And then we see exactly what we would expect. Base background rate jumps up massively um, in the earthquake. And then despite having Cyclone Stebi and Cook and then Cyclone Gita the following two years, overall, we're seeing a big reduction. And so if we keep, we keep forecasting that out, we expect we'll probably get back to background levels sometime around 2024, maybe 25, if it carries on at that rate in the coastal region. So that's encouraging. However, if we had Mount Fife into that, it's a very different picture. So it starts off the same, slightly higher background rates, but, um, you know, but fairly consistent. Massive increase during the earthquake. And then subsequently, slow to almost no change in the landslide rates since the event. They're sort of in the same ballpark. So we've got two distinct patterns going on here. In the coast, we're seeing recovery, fairly linear recovery that we can sort of predict to maybe 24, 25 would be back to base levels. In Mount Fife, that recovery is, is static or, or, or slow. And if you sort of push that out, it may be that we never get back to pre-earthquake events or maybe there needs to be some sort of event going on here that really triggers um, that off that accelerates that up. So we don't really have the answers yet to this. This is something the work that's ongoing is try to explain the differences we see between the coastal region and the Mount Fife region. But I think this, this helps to sort of split out some of the work we've seen in Nepal um, and start to think about how different locations could have different effects. And so that's really where we're at now is trying to, trying to pull, that, um, pull that all apart. 
So this is my last slide. I thought I'd just summarize where, where we've got to. Um, I think I'm getting close to my time anyway. So, and then, then we can open the floor up for questions. But so in, in summary, we, we, we can't think of earthquakes as short duration hazards. You know, we, we, we often present particularly to students in, in first, second and third years that, you know, earthquakes are almost the stereotypical acute hazard. They are several seconds to several minutes of shaking and we need to respond to that. Um, but the science has evolved massively on that. And I, we shouldn't be thinking of earthquakes as being you know, acute short duration hazards. They trigger this complex chain of secondary hazards, which we've appreciated for a long time. But what we've not appreciated is the duration of those, um, those secondary hazards. And really we need to move into a period where we think about earthquakes as being immediate short duration as a shaking, but then we have a long duration chronic set of hazards that evolve afterwards. And so if we look just at two events here that, that, that illustrate that, since the Nepal earthquake, landslides have extended downslope significantly, and the rates of landsliding today are still significantly higher than they were before the earthquake. That's expected. What's not expected is that since the earthquake, some areas are actually getting much worse. And so we're not seeing recovery, we're seeing worsening. Um, and this is really important because we see a decreasing trend in this region up until the election in 2017. And then since the election, we've actually seen um, landslides increase. And so this has real implications for how we recover um, and rebuild in a topography that's been heavily damaged by earthquakes. And looking at Kaikoura, what we see is that, you know, it's a similar sort of picture in that you know, earthquake rates are still significantly above the earthquake. Um, but unlike Nepal, landsliding has not gotten worse since the earthquake. So the situation was worst on the day of the earthquake and is slowly getting better. However, the slope recovery picture is much more spatially variable. So, you know, cyclones Cook and, and, and Debbie appear to have had an effect, but in the coastal region, it's, it's recovering quite nicely. Um, and soon we'll be, we'll be back to those background rates. But in Mount Fife, it's static or potentially, you know, oh, sorry, there's a slow decline or potentially even a static rate. And potentially, maybe we've reset the Mount Fife region to a new background rate, um, which is something that we sort of work is ongoing to try and tease out why that is um, and what, what might explain that. <clears throat> 